Uh, I started off as a fighter pilot and then was a medical school professor and then was pulled into a big bank and, uh, that was running 150 banks all over North America. And uh, then I, that got me involved in technology, got me involved with Ken, and evolved into Scrum. Our latest book on that is Scrum, The Art of Doing Twice the Work in Half the Time. If you don't know much about Scrum, that's what it's for. If you need to get twice as much done with half as much work, Scrum will do it for you. What I'm going to be talking about today, though, is how we're scaling Scrum, where what if you, don't, you have more than one team? Maybe you have 100 teams. Maybe you have 1,000 teams. Maybe you have 3,300 teams like Amazon uh, delivering a new feature more than once a second. That's, that's what Amazon does to dominate their markets. And we recently published a paper in the Harvard Business Review. For you who are managers out there, you ought to take a look at it. Uh, how do you scale Agile? 80% of what people call Agile is Scrum. Scrum is really one of the parents of the whole Agile, Agile movement. Uh, recently, I formed a joint partnership, my company is Scrum Inc., a joint partnership with the Scrum Alliance to form uh, a company we call Scrum at Scale to really teach people how to scale Scrum. Uh, coming into this conference, it was interesting to think back, okay, where does Scrum come from? Well, it has many roots, and one of the roots goes back to uh, Stonebreaker, because I was sent here to Cambridge to one of our banking sites, uh, and we were we needed a new higher performance database system for big banks. Uh, we wanted to move away from the old systems. We, we, <clears throat> we hoped to move into relational technology. We actually benchmarked 32 vendors. I had a special site in Denver set up just doing benchmarks for half a year or more. And at the end of that, we decided they're all too slow. So we had to create our own database. And it was an object database. Uh, the working name was DBX. It was built right down the street. <clears throat> uh, the concepts from Stonebreaker's work were pivotal in our thinking on how to build a high volume transaction processing system for banks. That then evolved into a company called Object Databases up, up on Broadway up the street here, which I, was, which I ran for many years. And it was there they pulled me in uh, that they created, uh, they formalized the product, Matisse, which is still around. Uh, it has a DDB, DBX object server back end. And <clears throat> because of all my experience in uh, technologies, and also we were consulting all over the world on how to use these technologies, I was pulled into Easel. And that's where Scrum as we know it began. So, there's some roots in Postgres that lead to Scrum. Now, as we try to get lots of teams working, uh, it's not just lots of teams that's a challenge. It, it's also, what if the teams are scattered all over the world? Uh, or what if you want to move Scrum across the entire organization? We have, we have entire organizations running with Scrum today. Even the senior management teams of Scrum. Uh, and really, the core of the issue is, how do you get teams operating really fast? If you can get 10 teams doing the work of 100 teams, you get a lot more product out there. It really drives revenue and market share. So one of the challenges that Scrum addresses quite well is, You've got a bunch of value that you're trying to deliver, and Scrum has this delivery cycle. Stuff needs to be ready coming into it and done coming out, and the pipe coming out is too narrow. There's not enough coming out, there's not enough product coming out the back end. Does anybody have that problem? All these great ideas, you just can't get them to market. So the whole point of Scrum is to open up that pipeline at the same time, actually getting the value side, the product side, 
higher quality, better design, more innovation. And the combination of more delivery with better innovation uh, is what is made from the dominant way of building new product, at least in the software domain. But now we're, I'm spending most of my time with oil companies, believe it or not, today. Okay, this is, Scrum is not, has moved way beyond software. Uh, almost none of our customers at the moment are software companies. They're all hardware companies, automobile manufacturers, uh, 3M, um, British Petroleum, all companies like this. So these companies have a lot of teams. And so the question is, how do we take the, the production from one team, and if we add another team, we double production? And what if you had 100 teams? Can you get 100 times much pr more production? Well, in traditional project management, that never happens, OK? The productivity per person goes down really rapidly as you increase the number of people on a project. But we, for the first time, actually, we had the first published paper showing linear scalability and uh, published in the IEEE Digital Library in, in around 2009. It was a company that had 50, uh, you know, 50 people in the United States and then doubled its size with 50 more people in Russia. And they, they more than doubled production. And when we published that paper, they said, nobody has ever done that before. And since then, we've had several Scrum implementations that have been able to do that and publish results. But nothing other than Scrum has ever been able to demonstrate linear scalability of production of teams. And it's because the whole uh, way of thinking about Scrum comes out of my medical school background, out of biology, out of systems thinking, the way cells in the body replicate, evolve, create subsystems, and the whole thing adds up to you, and you're here working pretty well with billions of cells in your body all collaborating. And to do that, you need what they say, tell me at Intel, you need a scale-free architecture. And that means that every node has to be the same as every other node. That's the way the internet is, right? Every node looks the same as the, every other node. And at, in, in, at Intel, they said, Jeff, don't screw up Scrum, because if Scrum is implemented right, every node looks like every other node. And to get linear scalability, you have to do it really well. Well, let's go back to the beginning of when I had to address this problem. I had been a medical school professor at in, you know, the University of Colorado Medical School for 11 years. And a big bank came by and said, hey, you're using the technology that we're using in the banks. And you guys have all the knowledge. But at the bank, we have all the money. What if we put the money together with the knowledge? And they made me an offer that my wife couldn't refuse. I wind up at the bank <laughs> as, as head of advanced systems. I'm, I'm working on the new technology. And I look at what's going on in the bank, and they have all kinds of programmers. But the biggest number were COBOL programmers. And these people, they, their projects are always late. And they're working nights. They're working on weekends. They're going on death marches. Are any of, you do, any of you doing that anymore? Death March to deliver that product? And I went into the CEO's office one day and I said, you know, uh, I've noticed all, all your projects are late. Have you, have you noticed? <laughs> and he said, yes. The customers are screaming every day. And our customers were CIOs of banks, right? We had 150 banks. And I said, well, you know, I'm just a medical school professor, but I have to tell you, I ran the mathematics on the Gantt chart that they're using to control the projects and calculated the probability of being late. And it's 0.9999999. You're virtually certain to be late on every project by using that technology. It's completely inappropriate for the, for the job at hand. And the managers make it even worse, because when they're late, they have more meetings, they have more reports. They're running around making it even later. Has anybody noticed that back at work? 
So he said to me, well, what should we do? Well, at the time, I had a, a leadership grant from the Kellogg Foundation, and I, uh, the CEO had agreed to let me travel around the world, spend a third of my time with these Kellogg fellows, and I was working with a subgroup of business school professors that were inter interested in entrepreneurship and innovation. So uh, I had actually brought them into the bank to look at the mess that we were in, and see if they had any ideas. And what we decided is that what we needed to do was implement a different business model. We needed to take a piece of the organization, separate it out, have a completely different operating system, and run it like a startup within a big company. So an entrepreneurial, and the book In Search of Excellence was popular at the time, and was kind of helped me think through this model. So mid-continent, 150 banks, we decided the business unit that would be taken on first was the unit that was rolling out auto, all the automated telecash machines all over the North America. And that was the biggest problem. They were losing a lot of money. Um, and so the solution was a better operating model. And these were the principles that were in, uh, in that book, In Search of Excellence. You know, Action, close to customer, autonomy of teams, Productivity through the people working better together, hands-on, uh, focused, lean, very lean implementation. And uh, simultaneous loose ties properly is what that means is the, the managers let go and they step back. They ask, ask, act more like investors. But investors don't completely ignore what's going on. They're actually really engaged, asking people what they need uh, to deliver the product. So that system I implemented using, at the medical school I had worked with Kerning and Ritchie at Bell Labs. I'd used their tools and techniques. And what I learned at Bell Labs is the best teams that did all this innovation were small. And they had eliminated all job titles. They only had one, member of technical staff. And <clears throat> the tooling that they could generate uh, <clears throat> conceptually could generate a completely new environment that was better than the old and you could live in this new environment and it was extremely different. And what I wanted to do is do the same thing that Bell Labs had done in their tooling with an organization. How can you spin up a completely different organization that has totally different characteristics, that is a lot more fun, is a lot more productive, a lot more interesting, and the customers really love it, okay? So booting up that new organization was the challenge. We put every employee that touched any part of the system, sales, marketing, install, support, we broke them down into small teams, four or five people, and uh, we had product marketing come in on Monday mornings, uh, and create a backlog based on business value. What is the most valuable item? We're gonna do that first. And we'll pull some of this work into a week-long iteration, which today we call a sprint. And on Friday afternoons, they would deliver. And I said, I'm gonna teach you <clears throat> how to land a project just like I learned or, and taught fighter pilots to land the F-4, which I flew, a, a, an aircraft that was designed to land on carriers. So you bring that down to final approach. You want to slam that right on the end of the runway, absorbs the energy, and slows it down, OK? So I said, I know you're going to screw it up. We're going to practice over and over again until everything on Friday goes live. It doesn't matter whether it's a sales proposal, it's shipped or it's software, it's live in all the banks. And sure enough, within about six weeks, they started planning that project at the end of the runway. And within six months, it was the most profitable unit in the bank. In the bank, I also gave them what is <clears throat> a common tool now in Scrum. I said, I'm going to give you the burn down chart so you can see where you are on the glide path. And we're going to throw away the Gantt charts. They don't work. So the, that was the first use of the burn down chart. 
all the way back in 1983. So when we started, costs were 30% more than revenue. Within six months, we flipped that, 60% swing in margins. So that was the first prototype of Scrum at Scale, and we've, we've taken that into many companies. I just put one in the bottom here, Pegasystems, which is right down the street, publicly traded company. And uh, in, about, in around 2009, we started implementing Scrum there, and you can see the stock price jumped about 400% while we're implementing Scrum. And then it, it stabilized. And they had Scrum running here in Cambridge, in India, at bots companies in Europe, Scrum everywhere. And I kept on telling them, you know, you guys could do a lot better than this because, uh, you know, you kind of stopped improving when your stock went up 400%. You could actually be way, way, way better. And it wasn't until, see where that stock pops again? Uh, some years later, they brought me in to talk to the product owners about innovation speed of delivery, how to form the product better. Uh, they told me, we think we have a product owner problem. So I came in and started working with the product owners. Whoa, the stock goes up even faster. So one of my goals with Scrum is to really make companies successful. I work with a venture capital firm. We want all our companies running Scrum. We run our venture capital firm with Scrum. Everything is Scrum. Why? At the venture group, we get three times the work and a third the time, okay? Uh, twice the work and half the time is conservative from the investor's point of view. That's only if you just don't do it too well, you can get that much. So all of this has been codified initially in the Scrum Guide, how Scrum works, and now into the Scrum at Scale Guide, how do you take one Scrum team and explode that up into hundreds of Scrum teams? I do a lot of work with senior management, and here's an example of a typical company I work with. Uh, not software companies anymore <laughs> so much. Uh, Maris, the biggest shipping company in the world. And they have problems like this. You know, This was in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, the price they could get for a shipping container was on the average about $600, but it was costing them $1,400 to ship. And they also, about half of their company was an oil company. And if oil dropped below $40 a barrel, they were losing money on oil. So, and it was doing that periodically. So big problem. They decided, we're going to fire the CEO. We're going to get a new CEO. We're going to split the company. And then the senior manager of the shipping company brings me in, Jeff, we need to do scrum. So I said, well, if you could do twice the work in half the time, then instead of $1,400 cost per shipping container, you could cut that back by a factor of four, and then you would make, be making a really good margins, and you'd put all your competition out of business. This is basically what Amazon is doing to everybody that, that they, every, every domain they walk into, that's what they're doing. When you have 3,300 scrum teams delivering stuff more than once a second, guess what? <laughs> if they walk into your business, you're going to be toasted really quick. So I said, here's how you do this from a management point of view. I asked them, I asked the senior management team, has anybody read the book Moneyball? Anybody read the book Moneyball in here? A few of you, yeah. One of them said, I read it 55 times. So I knew I hit the, on the right note. <laughs> I said, OK, well, Moneyball is about the Oakland A's baseball team. And they hired a statistician who figured out most of the runs are generated by people that can just get to first base. The home run hitters hit a lot of runs, but not most of them. And they cost a lot of money. So the statistician said, if you just hire people that can get to first base, our salaries will be low, and our runs will be high. Okay, so, so they did that. And so what this data shows is the Oakland A's had, within a year of doing that, they had the second highest win rate in the league, and their salaries were significantly less than average. So how do you get that uh, in a company, a software company, a shipping company, 
whatever kind of company. Well, if you look at the work that's to be done, the first thing we do in Scrum at Scale is prioritize everything. And every time we do that, we prioritize it at the top. We find out that 30% of the stuff at the bottom shouldn't be done. We had a big IT organization we did this in, and they looked at 30% of the stuff on the bottom for this work for the hundreds and hundreds of people it was all Windows 7 support. <laughs> and they said, most of, our, most of our users have gone to Windows 10. Why are we doing that? So in one hour, they stopped doing 30% of the work that hundreds of IT people were doing. See, that's how simple this is. But for most companies, they're unable to prioritize. Does anybody have everything priority one in your company? I meet a lot of people. I was, yeah, I was, I was doing some teaching yesterday, and the people said, everything is priority zero. Forget everything, priority one, OK? So you can't eliminate this work that's unnecessary unless you're able to prioritize. Then when you look at the remainder, we know from extensive data in the software industry over the last 30 years or so, 65% of the features that are built are never or rarely used by the user. So in Scrum, we have a product owner that's, who's charged with stopping building that useless stuff. And it's really hard to get rid of. Our venture group says, you know, the users say they want it. <laughs> It looks like it might be useful. It's only when you deliver it you find they don't use it. So you can only eliminate about half of that, OK? But a good product owner will eliminate half of that. So now you've eliminated about half of all your work by just not building junk, OK? So that's the first step of doubling production. Then you look at the teams that are actually building useful stuff. That's about 25% of what you're building is actually it's going to be used by the user. And we look at what is the efficiency of those teams. And we like a lean term called process efficiency, which is the value-added work time divided by the calendar time to deliver. So for most scrum teams, we find that if something should take an ideal day of work, it might take 20 days to get fully tested and done. So the process efficiency is 5%. I, I found most companies don't know that. GE knows it. We work with GE because they have I6 Sigma lean experts. And they, they run the numbers. They know exactly what the process efficiency is of their scrum teams. It's 5%. So if you take. 25% of the people delivering useful stuff, and you multiply that by 5%, the organizational delivery capacity is 1.25%. So that's the horrifying news. But the good news is that it's really easy to make that number go up once you know how to, how to do it. And so if you eliminate half of the work you shouldn't be doing anyway, you've got the first doubling, and then all you have to do is raise that process efficiency from 5% to over 25%, which is the definition of lean, and you will get the second doubling. And I recently worked with a team in India. I told them, make that number go up. And in three days, they made it go to 80%. And on the fourth day, they were done with everything for two weeks, for a two week sprint. So it is really easy to make that number go up. You can do it next week. So the simplicity of making this work is incredible. The hard part is getting people to prioritize and focus. Another interesting thing we're learning is from the Japanese. Uh, <coughs> uh, a professor who's been studying Toyota for the last 20 or 30 years just read a new book, and he sent me a note on LinkedIn. He said, Jeff, he says, you know, you're running around talking about productivity and lean all the time, and, but that's not where the money is made in Toyota. The money is made on the other side of the freeway, where all the chief engineers are. They're the guys that design the product. 
and they make 95% of the profit for Toyota. Only 5% is in the lean production side. And they make it by designing a really cool product that everybody wants to have and designing it for really low cost delivery. So he said, Jeff, you really need to focus on the product side of the equation. I threw a, I threw a few uh, numbers in Amazon because I've been talking to them lately. I've done some work with them. I've been talking to one of their leadership lately. And uh, they had more teams than I thought, delivering faster than I thought. And, uh, and they were a threat to Maersk. You know, I said, Maersk, what are you worried about? They said, well, we're worried about Amazon. Well, why are you worried about Amazon? You're a shipping company. Well, Amazon has a fleet of air airplanes. They're, 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 ship they're shipping all their own stuff on, the air on their airplanes. And we didn't know at that time, but Amazon had decided to set up a way of shipping stuff from China over the ocean in boats. They're going to take over the shipping by boat business. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so that's a real threat to Maersk. <laughs> and uh, I threw on, okay, you know, Amazon acquired Whole Foods recently, and everybody's stock went down like the next day. Okay. <laughs> And, and all the supermarket executives were whining and complaining. They were saying, it's not fair. It actually is not fair. They absolutely cannot compete unless they can convert their entire organization to Scrum and deliver a, a new piece of value to the customer every second. Then they can compete. So. Scrum is really powerful. Most of you are probably in the, how many are in the software business here? Most of you are in the software business. So uh, I do work, I still a lot of people that I, that I work with and train are in software. And <clears throat> one of their challenges is to be able to deploy continuously. So Ken Schwaber and I, my partner, we work with Microsoft, started back in 2005 with their Team Foundation System Group, eight products. It took them, with 3,000 people, it took them seven years to be able to deploy at the end of every sprint. When they started, they had 18-month deployment cycles. Seven years to get to deploy at the end of every sprint. And then it took them till last year, 2017, to be able to deploy every day, OK? And what people say who do this, it's not Microsoft, Yahoo has done this, many other companies have done this. The pain doesn't go away unless you can deploy every week. So the reason for that is that the cost of deployment goes down, 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 down as you begin to completely automate the operations deployment cycle. And uh, Dave Rico did a paper on this. What is the return on investment for going to a completely automated deployment like Amazon has? And he came up with 72,000%. So a lot of companies say to me, you know, particularly big bank, you know, that's really hard to do. It's going to cost them a lot of money. But they don't realize if you, with a 72,000% return on investment, you invest a dollar, you're going to get $720 back at the end of the day. There is no bank that has a return on investment that high for anything. So it's like this should be like the number one priority in the entire bank to do this. But the leadership doesn't understand the numbers. Okay? This is the biggest problem in industry. So let's look at some numbers. For the last, uh, I've worked with the Standish Group for the last 30 years. Jim Johnson is the CEO, and they've been they have a database of over 50,000 projects with hundreds of data items on them. And they've been publishing these reports every year. And about a few weeks ago, he said, Jeff, I want to meet with you. I was down in the Cape. We, we went and had coffee. He says, here's my latest report for this year. I've been trying to figure out why Scrum works for the last three years. And I, he says, I think I've got it. We have found in our database that the biggest separator between success and failure is what we're calling decision lat latency. How long does it take to make a decision? 
Good, it takes an hour or less. Bad, it takes more than five hours on the average. And for those 50,000 projects, the subset that has good latency, 58% success rate, and for the subset that has poor, 18%. He, they, he says, there's no bigger gap in my database other than this decision latency thing. So Scrum derives decision latency, and the decision making is slow because of bureaucracy, okay? All these sign-offs, all these layers of management. By the time you get a decision, it's more than five hours, and now you're in the bad category with a you know, 72% failure rate, and people wonder why. Maybe we need more managers so that we have more people involved in the decision. How do you think that would work? This is the kind of crazy thinking that goes on out in industry. So we need a minimum viable bureaucracy. So what is the minimum viable bureaucracy? Well, one of the things we th see when we people start uh, implementing, they want their company to be agile. So the manager says, agile means you guys down there in the trenches, you run faster, right? But up in, up in the corner office, we still get all the same reports. So we're going to create a translation layer. This is going to you know, shield us from the agility down there. <laughs> Might be a little chaos down there. And uh, we'll create some scaling framework, and then it gives us all the waterfall reporting. But there's no real executive engagement. And the decision latency is in the poor category, right? <laughs> so they wonder why Agile's not really working well for them, OK? Uh, well, they, they don't eliminate that 30% of the work that's, that's just totally useless, that dark work that should be thrown away. They don't prioritize anything. They can't get rid of it. Uh, <clears throat> they don't set up product owners that are driving uh, the prioritization of what's being built. You know, the managers want to come in there and change around what people are working on every day. Uh, they can't get twice the work in half the time. They, they will never get linear stability with this model. Unfortunately, wherever I go and I ask how many people have this situation, over two thirds of them are in this situation. So this is a common situation. For companies that actually do this well and get the benefits, uh, there's a significant change. They have teams. The teams are floating up into virtual teams, coordinating teams, and input is floating up to a leadership team that is resolving problems. And the best companies do this every day. Any problem that can't be resolved at a low level hits the leadership team every day, and it gets resolved. And the, the, the leaders are responsible for making sure the ecosystem works. And they're not responsible for micromanaging it. They're responsible for responding to, for, to requests for problems that they need help with. There are two kinds of problems. One is the operational problem, so we need a leadership team for that. But the other side is prioritization. So we need a leadership team, we call it a meta scrum and scrum of scale, that does all the prioritization. There is a chief product owner that prioritizes everything for the organization. And they meet regularly on a sprint cycle. We call this a medical scrum. And they meet regularly with the stakeholders, particularly with the management, making sure the management is supporting that backlog that they're creating. So what we're building up is the minimum viable bureaucracy to make this work is a leadership team for operations, a leadership team for our prioritization. And they're supporting. They're supporting the ecosystem where the teams are being driven by the product owner organization. And if you look at SAP, Microsoft, Salesforce, 
Spotify, many other companies, that's the way they work. It's very different than most companies. So for Scrum at scale, minimal bureaucracy is all we need is an executive action team that resolves operational issues, an enterprise Metascrum that, uh, that prioritizes everything in the organization, and what we call a Scrum of Scrums, which is a team of teams that coordinates multiple teams as they're working. So in Scrum, we have a Scrum master. We have their job is to enhance performance, protect the team from interruptions, create a good Scrum environment, generate continuous improvement. And if we have multiple Scrum masters, then we're going to, with multiple teams, we're going to have a team of teams meeting that we call a Scrum of Scrums that makes sure all the teams are being able to deliver together at the end of every iteration. And the model for this team is the same as the model for the other team. So every node has to look like the same as every other node. Well, what if we have more of these? So for example, 3M Healthcare has five business units. They all have lots of teams uh, at the top. There needs to be a leadership team that makes sure the whole ecosystem is running properly. Okay. Again, this leadership team is best run as a scrum team with a scrum master and a product owner. Similarly, on the product owner side of the equation, every team has a product owner. If we have many teams, we have many product owners. The product owners meet and coordinate backlog flowing into teams and this product owner team we call a meta scrum, it's meeting on a regular review cycle with the management, making sure everybody's aligned with the backlog. And if you have more, you just have more. It's all the same model. So it's simple. Everyone can understand it. They know who makes decisions. They know where to go if there's a problem. And here's more product owners. At the top, there's an executive Metascrum. So at 3M Healthcare, the chief executive said, I want to be the chief product owner. So I will pull together. I will make sure we have a chief product owner for every business unit. I will pull them together. We will meet twice a week. We'll prioritize everything in the organization. And then the chief product owners for the business units can go down into the business units and drive their priorities consistent with the enterprise priorities. And this is actually the picture that that organization looks like today. They have many scrum teams. They have an executive meta scrum, uh, an enterprise action team, a leadership team. There's some overlap uh, so that there's cross communication. Their people ops is their HR group. It runs as a scrum team. Everything is scrum. I remember when they were into this, they were two years into this rolling it out, and they were complaining to me, we only have a 280% improvement in productivity. You promised us 4x. You know, you're not doing your job, so we had to work harder <laughs> and try to get them up over. <laughs> so this way of thinking enables Professor Carter at Harvard has been a good mentor because he spent the last 20, 30 years writing about change. How do organizations change? You know, in his book, Leading Change, he points out 80% of change processes fail in organizations. It's hard. It's hard to change. You need a leadership team that, is, that can really drive change. And so part of implementing Scrum at Scale is to try to create that leadership team that drives change. Here's the data on agile projects versus traditional projects. It actually looks better than it did. This is for 2013-17. This is the latest report. I had 2015 data was worse than this previous. So things are improving. The agile success rate is up to 42%. We still have half of the agile teams that are late over budget with unhappy customers. 
And if you go in and you look at what is the primary reason for that, is they have no working product or service at the end of a sprint. So they're not compliant with the definition of Scrum and the Scrum Guide, which says that what you have at the end of a sprint is a potentially shippable piece of product or service. So there's still a lot of people talking about doing this that are unable to do it. But if you're trying, you're going to get double the success rate for not trying. Okay. So 42% success versus 26 in traditional projects. So if decision latency is, is you know, the top priority driver of successful delivery, the thing that Scrum does is that it pushes decisions down to the team level. As, ma as many decisions as possible are pushed to the front line. A product owner is available for every team to turn around a decision about priorities rapidly. And you have these three teams I've been talking about, the Scrum of Scrums, the Enterprise Action Team, and the Meta Scrum that are meeting on cycles so that they can turn around decisions really fast. And so it may be that Jim Johnson is right, that that is the, that is the reason, that is the reason why Scrum works. So we are in the business of training certified Scrum at Scale trainers right now, and we have about 29 of them trained. Every one of them has to come in with a case study and they're all being published on our website, so you can see what people are doing. The most interesting one lately was Lloyd's of London. 70,000 people, all at once, take them to Scrum. Uh, this is the biggest. The, the previous largest I've seen was at Intel, 30,000 people. Um, SAP has 2,000 Scrum teams. Uh, Amazon's a little bigger, they have 3,300. Uh, but Lloyd's of London has more people <laughs> than any of these companies <laughs> trying to change. And we do regular scum of scale training in, uh, in Europe and the United States. So those were my thoughts for today, and uh, I, I think I'm within my time box. We could even answer a few questions if people want to talk. Anybody interested in? I've got questions. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, sorry, I'm going to go this way. So um, I think, Jeff, as you know, we've been, we've been uh, adopting Scrum at EDB. We're in the early stages of our evolution, and I think um, it's, transform it's really transformed the way we think about organizing and operating and performing. Um, but but I, you know, we're doing that in the context of a, of, you know, of, of a kind of a structured leadership that's that's really trying to change the way the business operates. We do that alongside an open source, independent open source project, right. Postgres, which has you know, you know, diverse and, and highly distributed number of uh, developers around the world. So you know, within Enterprise DB, we're you know, working hard to be more efficient and more effective using right. agile models. Have you done any work, or do you have any examples with communities, independent open source projects or communities that have adopted Scrum effectively, and, and could you share those? There are many open source uh, Scrum implementations. Uh, <clears throat> one of the biggest ones is here, here in Boston is, is Drupal. Acquia is a big Drupal organization. They, it's a totally Scrum operation, and they try to get you know, their, their partners to be Scrum as much as possible. Uh, there was one very interesting uh, open source company <clears throat> Uh, here in Boston, I talked to the CEO a while back, and he said, you know, every one of his, every one, he's actually putting people on the payroll. It's kind of open source, but he hires people. So the way he hires people is, he says, okay, um, we, when you go on a team, you need to increase production proportionally to your entry on the team. And so he never, be, never meets them. You know, he gets resumes, he calls up, talks to a few people, and then he says, Sure, we'll hire you on, and if you meet your productivity increment, 
you're good, and if you don't, you're gone in a few weeks. So he gets a continually improving productivity. Every new product, he gets linear scalability for open source because he just doesn't allow anybody to stay around if they don't. So there's lots of innovative ways and approaches of dealing with this. But most developers today, particularly in the software domain, they know about Scrum. Most of them like it. There's still a few that hate it. Uh, but they at least know what it is. <laughs> and you can usually get people cooperating, even if it's, even if it's a, you know independent third party out there in the open source world. Um, let me open it up. Other questions from the audience? Do we have a mic out that we can move around? Yeah. Well, what we do, the best way, I'm going to tell you the best way. Uh, at Scrum Inc., we run everything with Scrum. And, and I'm on a team. And every team at Scrum Inc. and every customer we have want me to do something. But I have a product owner. So if people want me to do something, my product owner is the one that prioritizes that. And I basically do pretty much only what she says. Sometimes I come up with stuff I want to do anyway, but because I'm the owner of the company. But she complains bitterly about that all the time. But, but as long as I'm on my best behavior, I just do what's in her backlog. Do you think that makes me more efficient? I tell you, I get twice the work in half the time just by following her backlog. Because otherwise, I'd be scattered all over the place, responding to everybody all the time and never getting anything done. Remember, I used to come away from, I used to leave work at night and I'd, I'd say, oh, I was so busy all day long, all these meetings and dealing with all these people, and, and I got nothing done. Day after day, it would be like that. Does anybody have that problem? You leave work and you've got nothing done, even though you've, you've You've worked really hard all day. <laughs> and it's because you're, you're too scattered. You're, there's no focus. So my recommendation was <clears throat> you get on some team with a product owner that actually <laughs> shields you from all the noise, prioritizes all the requests, and you have a team of, of congenial people that you work with. And then if you're having problems, the team can even help you out. You know. Uh, at, at patient care, the last company where I was CTO, we we found that you know we we had more than one, but we only had a, a couple of database administrators, and you know we were deployed in like hundreds of hospitals and you know many teams. So we had to have the developers learn enough to backstop the database administrators, and we found that. For about 80% of the work that a database administrator could do, a developer could learn to do that. And it was really only the really hard stuff that we have. So again, if you had a product owner, she could figure that out and sort that out for you and keep the noise away and let you focus on getting good stuff done. And you would walk away every day saying, today we did this, today we did that, and we did the other thing. I feel like I accomplished something today. Do you feel that way now? A little bit. <laughs> you could feel more that way. <laughs> we have another question in the front. Uh, can you talk more about the, the, the planning, sprint planning phase of, um, so the product owners typically are looking at a high level for user stories. And they don't always translate directly into small implementation tasks for the developers. Right. And so you've got to go through this planning for your sprint in order to come up with right. the very small tasks. Uh, and I'm assuming that all happens right. before the sprint starts. And the, yeah. In the Scrum Guide, we talk about product backlog refinement. And the definition of Scrum says 10% of the entire team time is devoted to working with the product owner to get that backlog in a ready state to come into the sprint. And that, of course, has to be done before the sprint. So in this sprint, the team's working with the product owner to get stuff ready for the next sprint. Uh, it's typical that the product owners don't break stuff down small enough 
and they need the team's help in product backlog refinement to get it in the right shape. So it may be that there's not in that enough. You know, a lot of teams, particularly new teams, they think, oh, the product owner is going to come in with a backlog that's just perfect, right? And then we'll execute. No, never happens. The team has to help the product owner break it down, get it estimated, size properly, make sure it's all understood coming into the sprint. That's before sprint planning. If you do that well, then sprint planning is looking at, OK, what did we talk about? Uh, do we agree that we understand it all? Is it small enough? OK, how much can we pull into a sprint? Uh, the best practice is to use yesterday's weather. How much, could we, how much do we did, do in previous sprints? Just pull that. So if everything's ready and you just use yesterday's weather, sprint planning is really fast. And then people get off to a really good start. So a lot of these tricks and techniques have evolved over the years. And when people are having trouble, they usually, they're just not implementing what we know really works. Um, yeah, I have, I have a two-part question. The first part is, is it a bad practice to um, add stuff uh, to the sprint, uh, you know, during the sprint? And the second part is, um, you know, what is the percentage of time you want to keep aside uh, for, you know, things esc like escalations? You know, is it like, uh, you know, you allocate your 70% capacity um, to the sprint and, you know, keep 30% aside or 20% aside uh, for things that might come up during the sprint? So. Okay, for this, the second part, uh, in the book, Scrum, twice the work and half the time, we go through a pattern-based implemented Scrum, which is what we do today, because if you implement the Scrum patterns that we know really work, uh, <clears throat> they're all documented at the, on the scrumplop.org site on the web, and there's a new book coming out on them. Uh, these patterns are like plays in football. You know, uh, if you know the rules of football and you get out in the field, you still might lose, right? If you win, what, what do the winning teams do different than the losing teams? They both have the same rules. Well, the winning teams have plays that work, right? <laughs> everybody knows them. Everybody practices them. And a standard play in scrum is coming into the sprint, create an interrupt buffer for things that will be unanticipated based on yesterday's weather of what happened, okay? It's, it's uh, driven by, it's data driven. So we don't talk 70, 30%. We say, okay, how many points did you do last sprint or the average for the last three sprints? 50? Okay, yeah, okay. How many things, interrupts did you get for the last three sprints on the average? Oh, 10? Okay. Take 40 points of new work, leave a 10, 10 buffer empty space. The second part of that pattern is the product owner is the one that decides what goes in that buffer. So a product owner will get a request from a customer, from management, sales. A product owner may say, we're not going to do that now. It's a little priority. Or it's important, but it can go into the next sprint. Starts next Monday. Or the customer's down, we have to fix it now. That goes into the buffer. The third part of the pattern is if the buffer overflows, we stop the line just like Toyota. So OK, the sprint is stopped, and it's going to be reset. We're going to replan the work. The effect of that pattern is nobody wants to blow up a sprint and make it break. So the organization starts to self-organize to present, prevent the buffer from overflowing. So the team always has empty space in the buffer. So they tend to finish early. Well, there's another pattern that's, that shows that teams that finish early accelerate faster. Also, since the buffer never fills, the average size of the buffer sprint to sprint continually gets smaller. So if you implement this pattern exactly like I'm saying, your team will accelerate and your interruptions will go down. It's like magic, OK? I would never run a sprint today without it. So for those of you beginning on Scrum, you need to learn not just the rules, but how to play the game. <laughs> and how to play the game are in these patterns. The, the first, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that answers the question. 
sorry, the first part was adding adding things to the sprint during the sprint. Yeah. Okay. The definition of Scrum says is the product owner can change the backlog all they want, except for the stuff that's pulled into a sprint, and then they're not supposed to mess with it. And if they do, it will slow the team down. Okay. So good product owners don't do that. <clears throat> Our product owners at Scrum Inc. If there's a problem with the story that people are working on, they may pull it out. They may say, oh, we thought that was ready to work, but it's clearly not. People don't understand it. So I'm just going to yank that out so it doesn't screw things up. So, so we'll see good product owners doing that. But almost never, well, you'll never see a product owner putting anything in if they're a good product owner unless they slot it into the buffer. This is so important, it needs to go to the buffer. So that buffering is critical to making all of this run smoothly. Thanks. Jeff, I got another question. So there's, you describe a variety of roles uh, on, a, in, in, on a scrum team. Is there, is there one role that's more important to get right than another? And if so, can you explain why? <clears throat> well, there's only three roles. <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> People have been telling me the team member's role is well support. <laughs> right now, I'm a team member. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> the scrum master is really, I've never seen a great scrum team without a great scrum master. Because they're responsible for setting up the environment so that it really works and dealing with the issues on the team where people are, are blocked or having problems. And not just the technical issues, but the personal ones. Okay, so <clears throat> the product owner is responsible for Prioritize, getting good backlog and getting it prioritized. If they can do that, the team will immediately deliver twice as much stuff. So <clears throat> I tell our, pro, our scrum masters, OK, your job is to get a happy team delivering twice as much stuff. And I tell the product owners, your job is to have that backlog good enough that you get twice as many dollars for everything that team delivers. And if we do that, then the company has 400% more money and now the investors are happy. Everybody's getting their bonus. Everybody's happy. So which is more important? I mean, if the, teams don't, the team doesn't deliver, nothing works. If the scrum master can't create an environment where the team's happy, that doesn't work. And if the product owner doesn't double the revenue, that's not working. It's all, it, it's all pieces that have to work together. Great, great. Let me, um, let me ask one more question. So uh, as you may know, we're here talking about cloud transformation that's happening at an accelerating rate in, in many of the companies that we work with. And, and I'm just curious, as you look across the land, and, and that's taking the shape in the form of uh, the distribution of how uh, technology resources get consumed and applied to the business, you know, a, more away from IT th than ever in the past into the business unit. So the, you know, kind of the centralization of IT is, is, is changed dramatically in the presence of cloud acceleration and adoption. Is there anything that you've seen or learned in, in the work you've no. done that relates specifically to the challenges companies face as they're you know, tackling this, this transformation towards more cloud? Well, the, the, the whole, I mean, the whole, de it's running under the banner of DevOps now. We're gonna put everything in the cloud, it's, it's gonna be all automated and what typically that means for people that do it well is that there is a scrum team <laughs> that is actually deploying and they have automated tooling that they're using for that deployment. That's what Amazon has. So everywhere I'm seeing really success, so for example, where did that first continuous deployment occur in the agile world? I can tell you where it occurred the first Scrum team did it was a company called Individual in this area in 1995. And the developers were having trouble delivering, and I said, okay, put the server in the developer's cube. That's what we'll be delivering. And the operations people screamed. I said, you guys can't deliver, these guys will. And then the operations team came to me, they said, well, we'll do Scrum too. We'll, we'll be part of your Scrum, and we will meet every day in your Scrum of Scrums if you give us back our server. So I said, Okay, as long as you're scrumming. <laughs> so that was like the first. And then, uh, uh, then PatientKeeper did it on a larger scale back in, uh, starting around 2000. Then in 2007, I trained a company 
that was an operations company. They were just doing operations, supporting big banks and doing a lot of automation. They want to be totally scrum. So they are totally scrum. They are the leading operations DevOps company in the world. And at the same time, I was training a, a, a Dutch company, Zevia, on Scrum, and they were introducing de DevOps into KLM and many other companies, and they built a tooling, a Zevia tooling platform for DevOps, which is in the top right space. Of so if you look at what's really gone on, the Scrum has been the engine driving all this for 20 years now. So. Uh, whatever you're going to do in terms of technically deploying to the cloud or from a business side organizing that, you will do it most effectively with Scrum like this operations company that we booted up that's just totally Scrum. Um, when they started, they had hundreds of operations and deployment people. Uh, last time I talked to them, they had over 50% of their people were software developers because they found that they could take software development off the plate of their customers. They were so good at automated testing and automated deployment, they said, well, just give us your software too. We'll, fit, we'll just put that into the mix. <laughs> so, so because it's all Scrum, they, they don't distinguish between the roles, you know. Whatever needs to be done uh, can be done with the Scrum. Yeah, I think we're at an interesting time of convergence between cloud DevOps and Scrum, and so, uh, Thank you very much, Jeff, yeah. for coming in. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. And I think you're sticking around. Uh, yeah. And so people have a chance to spend some time with you after the session. Right. I think we're going to have some books out there. If anybody wants, wants a book, we're going to sign them. Yeah, please join Jeff for book signing. Jeff, thank you. Thank you.